everyone, and welcome back to this episode of Love Like Crazy. We're your hosts, Jay and Stacey Coleman. So glad that you've joined us today. And I just want to give a shout out to all of our listeners. Thank you so much for following and sharing and subscribing to this podcast. And listen, if you could give us a rating or some reviews, we would love that. That helps us get the word out. And so today we are joined with some very special guests. And so Jay, why don't you help me welcome our guests here today? Yeah, we're going to have fun today because we have Carlos and uh, Carolina Flores with us today. And Carlos, you, you guys have probably heard us reference him before. He's the one behind the camera. Uh, They actually own Hi Hello Labs, and they work with different individuals putting together podcasts, creative material, and they're a lot of fun to work with. And we are just so blessed to have them in studio with us today. Actually, Carlos, we're in your studio today. (laughs) Normally you come to us, but today we're... Yeah. In your yes. studio, we, man, we, I got to tell you, y'all's place is beautiful. It is. Absolutely Thank you. beautiful. Thank you. Amazing. We had to make a swap, you know, and I keep things <laughs> spicy between the relationship. <laughs> so how does it feel to be in front of the camera as opposed to being behind the camera? Well, I'm so used to it. <laughs> well, kidding. Carlos loves it. We're still debating if he loves the camera or the camera loves him. I got but, you. But, you know, I think, I think it's a, both. Yeah. I think we have it's a mutual both. relationship, yeah. <laughs> Carlos, I got to say, you look you look nice. You look mm-hmm. non-camera, you look nice. Thank so. you. Mm-hmm. Appreciate it. But thank you guys for being with us today. We're, we're going to talk about a topic that I believe is very important. A lot of our listeners, I think, will will benefit from this because we see within our our culture today that there's a lot of families who have children that have special needs. Uh, Years ago, you you saw this, but not nearly as much as you do today with children being uh, on the spectrum with autism, Asperger's, things of that nature. And it seems to be, you know, more and more of it, more prevalent, I guess I would say. Uh, And I think it is very beneficial for our listeners today to be able to know how to interact with families that, that have this within their family unit, but also there are probably listeners who are, are dealing with this within their own family. And so today we wanted to kind of take some time, just talk with you guys about this and, and your family dynamic. And so Carolyn, why don't you do this? Why don't you first of all, just kind of tell us a little bit yeah. about yourselves. Tell us about your kids. Yeah, absolutely. I love talking about my kids. I figured As you did. every mom does. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But first of all, thank you so much for having us um, on your show. Uh, we are so incredibly proud that Love Like Crazy is produced out of High Hill Labs. And so um, to us, it's an honor and a privilege to get to put our name behind what y'all are doing and, and be able to help you get this story out and get these mm-hmm. conversations out, which are so important, especially yes. in our in the world we're living in today. So thank you, first of all, for having us. Um, But yeah, Carlos and I have been married for 11 and a half years. Um, We have three wonderful children, Sebastian, Nicholas, and Amelia. And um, Amelia is three, but she is definitely the boss of the house. (laughs) (laughs) And Carlos's favorite. I wonder why. Um, But Sebastian is eight and um, Nicholas is seven. Mm-hmm. And Sebastian is our little guy who is on the spectrum. Um, so he was diagnosed with autism when he was just shy of three years old. And um, yeah, it's been a journey for the past five and a half years or so of, um, you know, living as a family with a special needs diagnosis and what that's meant for us, for our faith, um, for our everyday life, for how we think about our future and the decisions we make overall as a family has mm-hmm. been quite literally life altering. And so um, we're excited to have this conversation. Well, um, I want to thank y'all for actually t- for yes. being willing to, to step out and talk about this. Because like I said, I think it's going to be beneficial for so many people, not just families that, that have this within their family unit, right? Uh, but also with, for families who maybe they, they don't know how to interact with families or whatnot. Right. And and in this day and age, this culture, we need to be teaching our children Absolutely. that you can befriend and you can interact with children who have special needs. And in, in my opinion, look out for them, protect them, watch over them Absolutely. and be friends with them. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. So, Carlos, I, I know you're, you're I called it the reason why your youngest is your favorite because that's your your daughter. Your little yeah. girl. Uh, if, yes. I, if I had a little girl, she'd have been my favorite. Yeah. too. So, but. Um, <clears throat> I love my daughter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also love my other boys, my two boys mm-hmm. as well. And being a parent is hard. Mm-hmm. You know, definitely not something 
I was encountering or thought that could happen, but it is very difficult, not only in a, a like physical way, like financial or like, um, pr like physically protecting, but also like the development and mm -hmm. who they're going to grow up to be and how they're going to grow up to be. And, you know, we have a, a son with special needs who has autism. So that curveball is also... It, it almost counts for 10. Mm -hmm, <laughs> so mm -hmm. we we definitely have our hands full. But I love I love my boys, but I love my baby girl. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes. I would imagine if I like I said, if I had a little girl, she would be my favorite. Uh, she'd be spoiled rotten. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because I now I have you know, the we first grandchild was was mm -hmm. granddaughter. Yeah. And she's rotten. She knows mm -hmm. she can run the pop. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Wherever she wants. Wrapped around your finger. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about the when you guys first found out about Sebastian. Yeah. And you know, you you probably notice something something here. We need to go talk to a specialist, a doctor, whatever. What were some of the signs that y'all started seeing? Like, hey, we need to go talk to our doctor his pediatrician and find out what's going on here. There's some challenges. Yeah. So um, the first thing I'll say is that um, Sebastian had a very, he was my, our firstborn. And mm -hmm. so, you know, as a first time mom, and I'm yes. sure um, Stacy, you can relate to this. You just, you don't know what you're doing. Right. right. And so everything just feels like, you're just mm -hmm. like, well, I guess this is normal. I, I, all right. Mm -hmm. And so um, his delivery was, was pretty rough experience. And, um, shortly after we noticed things like he never crawled he would just scoot or um he would babble but not necessarily have any words or um it got to a point right around he was 18 months old um nicholas had just been born so we got pregnant with nicholas when sebastian was just nine months old so mm -hmm. here you are yes. with a baby Close and now together. you've got another baby mm -hmm. coming and you're just like there's so much happening um we started noticing some regressions so skills that he had things like he was able to you know feed himself with a baby fork he couldn't do that anymore mm. um the way he was chewing instead of chewing his food he was nibbling on his food and again no real words i haven't heard mama mm. you know just a lot of like grunting and pointing um you know we would talk to him and and there just it almost felt like you were like he was just in his own little world kind of mm -hmm. thing um and so you know I would talk to other mom friends and they're like well, you know boys take longer and you know we had a family member I was like well my kid didn't talk till they were four and so you start hearing something and you're like mm -hmm. well I guess I guess you know I'm not I'm you know I don't want to be the crazy mom I don't right. want to be the hypochondriac yeah. mom you yeah. know like yeah. you know and I would bring it up to my pediatrician and um I remember when we started seeing those regressions that Nicholas was born they were like, well, it's just because he wants to be the baby because the baby's getting because all the attention. Baby, and right. So there was always a reason that these things were getting kind of, um, you know, debunked, if you will, mm -hmm. all of my concerns. And I will say this as a mom, and I know, Stacey, you will mm -hmm. probably agree with me on this. We just have an instinct. We right. just know. Yes. Right. There's a gut instinct as a mom that you're just like, you know, something's not right. You just can't put not, your finger on it. Yes. Right. Something's not right. And so. Carlos and I would get into arguments all the time because he's like, you know, you're just overlooking into things and why gotta be so dramatic? He's mm -hmm. fine. You know, he'll grow. He's just, you know, he's a boy. He'll grow mm -hmm. into it. And he was in a lot of denial. And I just, I'm so glad that I didn't um, give in to that mm -hmm. because I'm like, all right, well, that's fine. You go off. At that point, he was traveling a lot for work and, and just working a lot. And so it was just me and Sebastian for a little bit there. And then I've got Nicholas, on, you know, on my hip. And um, I started making all the appointments. And so what I found out was that um, these appointments take forever. You get put on wait lists mm -hmm. for everything mm -hmm. that has to do with, with these appointments and neurologists and all this stuff. And so um, I remember just like, all right, that's fine. Okay. Meanwhile, we're on a six-month wait list and I'm getting yeah. ready to, to get him in. And so, yeah, long story short, um, we were able to get him in with a behavioral pediatrician. And they, about two hours later, after an evaluation, they gave us the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, at that point, it was 
for me, it was a bit of a relief because you're like, okay, I'm not crazy. At least you have an explanation. We have an explanation of why, you know, he lines things up. He doesn't play like a normal little Mm -hmm. boy. You know, all his toys were lined up. He was hyper focused on trains. Like there was just things that weren't normal, you know, Mm -hmm. quote unquote, what is normal, but normal. Um, And so that for me it was a big relief of like okay now we can do something about it now we know Mm -hmm. what it is there's a name to we can do something about it um whereas carlos experiences was a little different because to him it was like a bucket of cold water right you know he just he was not expecting that even though i had been telling him for months Mm -hmm. that hey i don't think something's right so yeah (laughs) it's one of those things that you never think is going to happen to you. Mm-hmm. And you just, I mean, I've been i have been hearing some of your episodes and some of your interviews with some of your guests. And it's also like things that you never think it's going to come your way. Right. Um, You're blindsided <clears throat> by it. Oh, completely, completely. And here's the thing. I grew up a Christian. Christian home, good ethics, God, all of the above. I was a great kid, great student, kept my sexuality, let's just say, pure till marriage, like never slept around or anything like that. So as well as my wife did. So here I am, married, was a virgin when I got married. So I'm like, God, I've kept all this to honor you, Mm -hmm. to do all this, to obey and be good and all these things. And it's like, and you just gave me a child with a problem mm. that the problem will be a, is a condition because they will always have it. So in my mind, there was a lot of anger. Mm-hmm. Did you feel like maybe like I've been good, I've done all these things. I deserve. I deserve. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Did I you did. feel like maybe the Lord was like, what, like this is a punishment or? No, I couldn't understand it. And to be quite frank, and I probably one day when I, when I meet him, I'll ask him, Mm -hmm. why, you know, Mm -hmm. now do I love my son and do I see now a purpose? Yes. But it's always hard to see things in the world, in the natural world. It's like, why, why are all these kids, you know, being trafficked or hungry or killed or whatever? You don't understand why. Like, there's a lot of whys that we don't understand. So one one of my why is like, why did I do all this? Kept myself, and I have a son with a condition. Yet, there's all these friends of mine who slept around and did all these things, <laughs> and their kids are perfect, mm. quote unquote. Yeah. You know? And I think, I mean, and I want to speak to that a little bit because I think that is the reaction of a lot of, especially Christians. Um, and I think it's a old way of thinking of like Mm -hmm. well there must be this punishment (laughs) for my sin there must be Mm -hmm. sin in our camp that we are being punished in this way and i think part of um where i think the church can start really making some change and differences and really serve our community as special needs families well is starting there by changing that thinking of hey it's not a punishment it's a blessing it's a punishment It's a blessing. It's part of the plan. And we don't have to uh, figure out the why. That's not our job, yeah. right? Yeah. Our job is to love people well. And so um, I think that's one frame of mind that, you know, because we can't explain it, then we'd rather just stay back and not do anything about it, not say anything. And so mm-hmm. that's, I think, where that alienation of those families comes in and where I think the church can do better. We can all do better. Well, let me ask you this uh, in regards to that, because we were children's pastors for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. You don't see in that day, that was 20, 20, 25 years years ago that we were in that role almost 30 years ago. And you didn't see nearly as many children with special needs as you do now. Autism was almost non-existent in that day and age. So there's got to be an explanation for why we're seeing a rise in this within our society. Absolutely. We we have some some guesses. People talk about it. I don't want to get into all that today. But within the church, our philosophy, we were children's pastors. Uh, We don't want to separate these children and put them off in a room by their, Mm -hmm. you know, in another 
special needs room or whatever. We want to include them right. in what's going on and have workers with them and have the children accept them and love them. Yeah. And that's kind of what we have done at, at, at our church at Journey. Uh, and it's kind of been that mindset from day one. Right. And we're seeing more and more of that, you know. Right. Now, there have been some children that we just weren't, you know, equipped, right. you know, to be able to, to handle some of the needs that they had. But by and large, most of the children that we've had come in that, that have these needs, they're just right smack dab in the middle of everything. <laughs> yeah. And, and that, <laughs> mm-hmm. it depends on what, you know, what right. their, uh, their, there may be some sensitivity to lights or things of that nature. And we have to deal with that. But by and large, our, our mindset has been just to keep, include them right in the middle. Cause to me, it doesn't separate that child, but it also teaches the other children Correct. to be very accepting of them. What, what are yes. your thoughts with that? I think that's wonderful. And I think that First, that is, thank you for yeah, thank you on behalf steps. of all those families that I sure feel, you know, very seen and heard. And I will say this, Carlos and I actually, um, one of the reasons why we stepped away from church at the beginning was that we were a part of a big church that we thought would embrace our family with Mm -hmm. open arms. And the reality was they, one, were not equipped, but two, didn't even try to figure out what our needs were and what, you know, what we needed as a family. And it's very disheartening when we're in worship and we put our kids in the kids section and kids church. And you just kept seeing that number pop up. (laughs) Come get your kid, come get your kid, Mm -hmm. come get your kid. And you're just like, why are we here? Why are we here? Then we try to bring him in with us, and you know our our son loves music. He loves worship. He loves dancing. I wonder who he takes after, <laughs> just being in the spotlight. And it was very sad that he would get up to dance in the aisle, and an usher would come in and tell us he needed to sit down. I'm like, he's a kid. Like yeah. he's a child. He's worshiping. There's music on. Like, why is this a problem? Um, and then it was so like, oh, well, you was, can go in that like, room. You can go in that mm-hmm. room with it's the nursing darker family. darker and you know. all the parents are there. And it's like, well, might as well go home and watch it online. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and so we got used to the online. It was funny because when COVID hit and everyone's freaking out about going virtual, well, we were already used to, it. Used to mm-hmm. that. And I mean, honestly, Stephen Furtick's church and Elevation, they were kind of a bit of pioneers in that. Um, you know, we were part of the EFAM. Like that was our church yeah. for, mm-hmm. for a little bit there. Um, and I think now we, we found a a great church, which is actually where our kids go to school, but they're doing it really well. And, um, I think it's amazing, you know, that we can include the kids that can be included and, you know, have a safe space for the kids that can't. I think a lot of churches are realizing this isn't going away. Right. And it's, it's getting, you know, you're seeing a a rise in this area. So we, we need to be able to accommodate that. My mindset wasn't to, to simply accommodate it. It was, I just didn't want these kids to feel separated and excluded from everything. I wanted them to be able to, and at the same token, I wanted our children, not just our kids, but kids in general, uh, to be be accepting of them and loving towards them. Now, that does not mean that you do not. Some kids are scared. Yes. Some kids, you know, yes. don't know what to do or There's say. Which, different situations, yeah. Which right. is understandable. I mean, I, I get it. Kids are mm-hmm. kids. But, uh, you know, I, I would just say that it, within the, the body, Christ within the church, and it, we, we this is an area where we need to really work on. Absolutely. Because uh, we need to be able to to minister to these families that have these needs within their life. So yeah. you felt relief whenever you got the diagnosis. Right. And I'm, uh, it's, I, I guess, safe to say maybe you felt a little bit more surprised or shocked. I, I think I went through like the five stages of grief. Okay. It was a process. Yeah. It was a whole process. It was mm-hmm. months before where I was in denial. And then after I accepted the condition, I was angry. Mm-hmm. Then after being angry, I was um, sad. Sad. And then I was bitter. <clears throat> and then I was sad again. <laughs> and then <laughs> bitter. And then finally it was like, okay, this is life. But it took about six, a good six, seven months our marriage took a toll on that process because you have a warrior going after like, I'm fighting for my child and giving him every opportunity. Mm -hmm. And at that time we had another baby Mm -hmm. because they're, they're uh, 18 months apart. So we have another baby. We have a child with special needs. We're going through therapists and it's like one bad news after another, after another. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. Oh my, because it wasn't just, Oh, 
he has autism. Oh, now he needs feeding therapy. Now he needs this. Now he needs to go to the eye doctor. Now it's mm -hmm. like all these things just kept like escalating. And as a parent, you're like, it's overwhelming. it breaks you. Mm. Because, for example, feeding therapy was really bad for me because they strap them mm. to a point where, like, well, okay, let <laughs> you make it sound like they were torturing the kid. No, it like, wasn't torture. But as a parent who doesn't see that, it's like, yeah. what are you doing to because my child? You didn't have and he's crying, yes. banging his head. Like he 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 doesn't understand why he's being strapped because again, he's very limited in his diet, so he eats very little, very mm -hmm. few things. So we're trying to get him to like eat more. So to me, I'm watching and I'm like, I'm in the break of tears and I'm angry and it's like, I want to slap the, like the doctor or the therapist, but I, and we knew it was good for him. Like it, mm -hmm. it was a process, but for me, it took me a while where Carolina was like, we can do this. I got you. Okay. I know it hurts, buddy. I'm with you. And with me, it's like, I internalized all the anger. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to like bulldoze, like, <laughs> get your hands off my child. Mm -hmm. So it definitely was a process for me. It was a process in our marriage. Um, but this is where I think like, you know, God sent us in pairs mm -hmm. because during that time I probably would have, you know, not been okay, not been okay, <laughs> where she needed to be strong and, ca and she carried mm -hmm. a, us a lot. And I was traveling a lot too. So she was carrying most of it on her own. And I was just like, how is she okay? Mm -hmm. Because again, I'm human. I'm feeling these things. I'm sure she's feeling a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. But I guess the timing, mm -hmm. she didn't. It was like, I don't have time to cry cry you a river or cry life a river. I, I, I need mm -hmm. to like push right. through. Yeah. Now, if you want to cry a river... Go in that corner and deal with it yourself. <laughs> but right now, we I have work to, to do. I have a baby yeah. and I have a toddler right. and the toddler needs me. So in other words, she's basically saying, hey, if you want to cry, I need you go cry, get it over with, but check back in because I need some help here. Get your behind <laughs> right. here because I'm not doing this alone. Now, I thank her because she was patient in that process and she let me process it on my own. But she's done many other things. Again, entrepreneurship is another thing that we can talk about that later. But... She's been such a a pillar in this family. And I think, you know, moms are, that's who they are in the family. They're yeah. the heart. They're the pillar. They're, they're the ones advocate. that keep everything oh, together. They're going to advocate for their babies. That's right. So sure. there was times where I would get upset because he didn't want to go to sleep, you know. And we have all these, all our best friends' kids, again, they're super good looking. <laughs> they're super well behaved. <laughs> they're very smart. So the nucleus of our of our friendship, of our friends, all their kids are great. And then it's like, Sebastian. So for a long time, that also had me like, God, I come from the same line of people. Like, why? But what, what we loved and what was great is that our nucleus of people helped us. Mm -hmm. We had a great support system That's from wonderful. our family to our friends mm -hmm. to like, anyone that was around us and then we started realizing okay well not that i realized god told me you're not going through this for you you're going through this for those who are going to come before you after you after you mm -hmm. and i'm like okay i get it and 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 sometimes we go through grieving processes mm -hmm. and it's like why me god why me it's like buddy it's not about you it's about those that are going to come after you that are going to need you to speak into their lives to help mm -hmm. them to support them and to shed a light because they won't have the strength that you have right now right in other words it's not about you it's about what i can do through you yes, yes. Mm -hmm. what i can accomplish yeah. through your life down the road mm -hmm. so yeah. don't steal that that's my message yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know uh, it was very cool and um <clears throat> just to interject this part that not cool but it just um God in his mercy and just shows the nature and the character of God, I think, too, that um, while we were going through this, part of the feeding program um, was we had to basically live at the children's hospital for five weeks. We would literally go home and sleep and then be back at 6.30 a.m. all the way to 6.30 p.m. And we were there all day. And I will tell you, nothing is more humbling, I think, as a parent to have to sit through a children's hospital 
every day <laughs> for five weeks yeah. and see other parents with their small babies going through cancer, going through um, life-threatening situations. Mm -hmm. um, even in his feeding program, other children that are going to live with a feeding tube for the rest of their lives. Just situations that you're like, wow, I don't have any problems. My <laughs> life is absolutely mm -hmm. perfect. Um, but because we were going through that and because we were there, God opened so many opportunities for me to pray with families, to give families oh, hope that wonderful. don't have Jesus, that don't know God, mm -hmm. that don't have a relationship with him. And yet I was able to be there to be light for that person. Um, and not, not like, oh, look at me. I got to be there and pray with them, but like God in his mercy, mm -hmm. right? Like we don't know that what those families were going through, those right. marriages were going through and they right. needed Jesus in that moment. And, um, I just humbling that. I got to partner with God in those moments and that would have never happened yeah. if right. me and Sebastian weren't there. Right. So, and yeah. you think about it, sometimes people are like, you're like, oh, I understand what you're going through. No, you don't. So a special needs family, knowing what other families are going through and they're praying for them, it's almost like you do get it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Like It's like mm -hmm. a cancer patient or a cancer survivor praying for a cancer patient. Right. They understand each other. Mm -hmm. They understand that pain. It's terrible mm -hmm. to say it in this way, but it's kind of like you're you're in the club, right? You, you know, exactly. you're 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 part of this family. Yeah. You're in the club, and in some so ways, you, know. you feel like mm -hmm. yeah. the community gathers. You were talking about um, a grieving community. Mm -hmm. There's a community of like I'm a part of a autism dads group on Facebook, mm -hmm. and we lift each other up. And there's gatherings, and it's like. We know that you you can't do X, Y, Z because of your child, but like there's other parents and, and that's mm -hmm. great. Do you find that there's more support available now as opposed to many years ago? Oh, yeah. Even mm -hmm. even five years ago, mm -hmm. the amount of resources, information, um, support groups. Again, it's unfortunate that I believe this is the epidemic of our times. <laughs> I really do. Mm -hmm. Um and yeah, I won't get into that. I'm not trying to get canceled <laughs> on the show. Um, but yeah, this is a, a problem. But at the same time, there is this support system that is mm -hmm. available now. And because there's so many families, you know, I think the world is waking up to, hey, we've got to we've got to we step in and, and provide resources. Yeah. Yeah. I think that by and large, there's been a lot of, you know, wanting to just pretend that something's not there. Oh, for sure. Or it's in such a small number that it's not really worth paying attention to. Right. And hopefully the, the the medical establishment's waking up right. and realizing mm -hmm. that there's something to this. This is not just, you know, happening to, to couples on a more frequent basis, but something is causing this. Absolutely. And, and they will, I will tell you, I think they saw it during COVID, but the medical establishment is about to, is seen the wrath of some fierce mamas yeah. <laughs> and some mama bears that we're yeah. not taking your answers anymore. And mm -hmm. we, that gut instinct yeah. is in full effect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I can tell you that uh, I love my wife. She's beautiful and loving and sweet, but you want to see the claws come out and mess oh, with yeah. the kids. <laughs> yes. Mess with For the sure. babies. <laughs> mama and bear. Mama Very bear protective. wakes up and it's like, it can get ugly real quick. Yes. Yeah. yes. So l let's talk about, you know, whenever we, we think of your children, you've got uh, one with special needs and two that are neurotypical children. They, mm -hmm. they, you know, they don't have the needs that Sebastian has. How do you balance that? How does that work out on a day-to-day -day basis as far as, and how do they, do they just view Sebastian as just their brother? I mean, it's not like. Yeah, it's really sweet. Um, they, well, first of all, I think, and I, and I think this goes for every family, right? Like every child is so different. Mm -hmm. Even if Sebastian was neurotypical, like they're just so different. You're like, right. I birthed all three of you. Why are all three of you so different? One of you yes. is crazy for sure. Yeah. So um, they, it's not, they're all, it's not Sebastian. And it's not Sebastian. I'll tell you that much. No, they're all so different. Um, and so you parent them uniquely, mm -hmm. right? right. Um, and you love them uniquely. Uh, for who they are. But I think giving Amelia and Nicholas um, some very important quality time and giving them the space to do some of the activities and things that Sebastian can't participate in um, is is very important to us mm -hmm. and to them. And the other thing is educating. Um, 
you know, Nicholas knows that Sebastian, Emilio's too little right now to understand, but um, they, it's interesting, even Emilio, though, does know that, hey, there's some special accommodations for Sebastian because he has different needs. Um, but Nicholas knows, like, my brother has autism, and I will tell you, that little boy is his best friend, his therapist, <laughs> his biggest protector. He's like, I don't know, what, a foot less than Sebastian, but he will stand up for his big brother um, like no one else will on that playground. And so... And slap awesome. him and hit I think, him yes, and punch but him. Also, <laughs> yes, but um, I think just educating them on mm-hmm. like, hey, he's not he's not um, less. He's just different, and that's mm-hmm. okay. Mm-hmm. I, rem- I remember, sorry to interrupt you, we had the, when we had the diagnosis, when we were at the clinic, it was such a, I mean... Honestly, I thought I was going to pass out um, as a doctor was was talking to us. Um, but she said, because Nico and, and Sebastian were at this little table with, with games. He's like, we were like trying to like, how are we going to do this? And, and the doctor said, he's going to be his biggest advocate. So it's good that there is a brother, a sibling mm-hmm. so close, so close in age. age. And we were like, wow, well, okay, I guess. And we yeah. see it now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sometimes we don't understand what Sebastian wants or needs. But so we're does. like, Nico, what is he? What, he what does Sebastian want? Oh, He's yeah. talking this. Mm-hmm. He wants this. Oh, and not just with us, but with grandma, grandpa, and yeah. so on and so forth. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, it, I'm just curious. Is he still obsessed with trains? Oh, oh yes. yes. <laughs> he There's will more tell you. So, so he actually didn't um, have full. Uh, language till he was about six so um even now he can't carry a normal conversation like you and i can but he can talk and express himself verbally um to his capacity but he will tell you every single name of all the thomas and friends trains he'll tell you train parts and where they like his dream is to go to london to go see all the steam engines and he's just obsessed with Mm -hmm. With, I say he's going to be an engineer by day and a Broadway star by night. <laughs> <laughs> is he pretty high functioning? I know that, that different children with different, different needs, they are, yes. some are more high functioning. Than those. He's, he's pretty fu- high so functioning. So he's a, what they consider mid-functioning. Okay. So not quite enough to be completely independent. He goes to a private special needs school. Um, he's not able to be in a, in a neurotypical mainstream school classroom um but he's enough where he can communicate needs and um and be somewhat independent okay so like he dresses himself now which is a big win for well, us puts his own <laughs> shoes on yeah that's, that, good. That, that's a big win yes yeah. big even win. whenever you, you have children that are neurotypical when they can do those yes. types of things you're like okay it gives me a break to yeah. be able to go do something else right? and a big win for us he's fully verbal yeah. Which yeah. was nonverbal. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. So yeah. now at least he tells us what he wants. Yes. <laughs> you don't have to guess. Someone put my shoes on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no guessing there for sure. So if you had some advice to give to other families with special needs, what, what would you want to, to say to them? I think my main advice would be um, give yourself permission to live on the seesaw of faith. And that means that it's not if or, it's and both, right? Mm -hmm. It's okay to say, God, this is not cool with me. (laughs) Why is this happening? I don't understand it, but I trust you and I trust you. Um, God has a good plan for your life, for your family, for your child. You don't love your child more than God does. And Mm -hmm. he's got a plan for him. And at some point as a parent, I think all parents have to do this, but especially as a special needs parent, you got to trust that God has a plan for him right. so or her. So, I think right. that, the, you know, a lot of times we've been taught, oh, you can't question God. Right. You can't have doubts. Well, the problem is we're human beings and exactly. we have questions and we have doubts. Yes. And, and I've said this before, you know, to our church that it's OK to have doubts, but don't let those doubts take over. Exactly. Yeah. It's OK to have questions. You may not get the answers, though. At the yeah. end of the day, you just have to trust God. And yes. God's not taken by surprise how we're feeling or how we're having to process exactly. things. He's not caught off guard exactly. by that at all. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, what what is a piece of advice that maybe you would give to parents that have neurotypical children that this has not touched their life? What would you tell them to say, hey, look, you know, Within our family, we're experiencing this, 
and this is something that I wish you could see or do or whatever. So what's a piece of advice you would give them regarding, you know, having relationships with other families that have special needs? When you see a family at the airport <laughs> and their kid is having a meltdown, don't let your first stop be, if that kid were mine, I would Because you have no idea help. what was really going on and what's behind because that. Because the amount of times we've been at airports and we get the stink eye or the awful looks from other families, it hurts more to think, one, my child is kind of embarrassing himself. And then it's like, oh, I kind of feel embarrassed because they're looking at me weird. And then there's times where it's like, let me throw the middle finger because <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't care what anybody thinks because this is my baby. Mm-hmm. And I'm, so I would say have compassion over those families yeah. that have special needs, okay. be a help. And, um, and I, I would love to ask to the, add to that um, two very practical things. One, um, don't wait to be asked to help. We're already (laughs) drowning. And so the last thing, a lot of times in general, moms feel Mm -hmm. like we can't ask for help. So moms, if you're special needs moms, ask for help. It's okay. But as a friend of of those families, don't wait to ask for help. You know, just show up. Bring Mm -hmm. a meal. Um, Don't be afraid to interact with our family. Um, One thing that I love about our friends is they're not afraid to just treat us like another family and ask questions. Hey, would this be helpful for Sebastian? Would this be okay for your family? Hey, we would love to come visit. What would be the best way to do that? Like, just ask questions. We're yeah. normal families with, and we just, you know, we want to be involved and do those things. And if I don't have to put myself in a position that is like, hey, just so you know, but you come and ask me, it shows you care and it shows mm-hmm. that you see my family and that you genuinely want want to be around us so include them include them like be inclusive with those families because it's very easy to become isolated Mm -hmm. because you don't want to burden or or you know bother anybody but like we want to know that you want us around Mm -hmm. even though we have a kid on a wheelchair or we have a kid that we need to feed or something because Mm -hmm. it's important to Communities, communities, yeah, huge. Communities You're right. yeah, we, we do in our sp- neighborhood. Last story, <laughs> where we used to live, our 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 kid was known as the naked baby because he would <laughs> run off naked in our neighborhood, and it's like he was running down. But our neighbors, there was a point where we had to tell all, all our neighbors, like, "Hey, listen, we have a son with special needs," because there was a time where he would open the door and just take off. So we had to, and naked. So we had to like, you know, kind of warn everybody and tell everybody. And everyone was so on board and supporting us and taking care of it. Oh, that's good. Yeah. He ran out one time and our neighbor literally came over and just covered him and immediately called us. And it was like, just that like. We thought he was watching a, a movie. And it, I mean, this happens in seconds. Second. So if you're sitting there judging us going, well, where were you when this yeah. happened? Okay. This stuff happens yeah. in seconds. Yeah. Um, He's a but <laughs> thankfully, because our neighbors had asked and they knew, everyone knew, like, oh, okay. And it was so beautiful to see how immediately, Protective. like, someone came and covered him. Yes. Somebody else came and ran to our door. And it was just like this community effect mm, of, yeah. that's wonderful. Everyone, we're here for you. And then a gator infested state. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, right. That, that has its own challenges. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, well, and you're like, look, just so you know, uh, with, with, Children that even that are neurotypical things can happen. In, in oh, right. exactly. <laughs> it's like right. okay, I, you know, how did that happen? Right. Um, remember one time, Stacy dozed off on the couch and she wakes up, <laughs> and Tyler was sitting there with chocolate syrup all over. Oh him. no! He got in another refrigerator, covered his entire body. And, and it's like, oh, no. like I just dozed off for a moment. Yeah, because like, I think she was yeah. pregnant. At yeah, that I was time. pregnant with the next Bless. one. Yeah. yeah. So, well, thank you guys so much for yeah. for being a part of this uh, episode and sharing, just being real and yeah, honest. Thank you for sharing with your story. I think yeah. that that is something that that a lot of times pe- that this is a subject that is being talked about more and more. Yeah, uh, mm-hmm. and I, I'm grateful within the community to see that people are willing to to step up and help neighbors, churches, and, and whatnot. So thank Absolutely. you guys for being open and real. Thank to you. That. Of course, yeah, of course. Thank you. thank you for having us. Yeah. Well, tell us where. How can people find you? Well, um, I'm on Instagram, so follow me on Instagram. <laughs> at, I'm at Carlos Flores. 
And then the name of our business is Hi Hello Labs. So if you ever have any media needs, add Hi Hello mm-hmm. Labs. Yes, and yeah. we highly recommend them. Yes, <laughs> and I can be found at Instagram as well at Carolina Deplon Flores. That's a lot, so we'll have it linked in the show notes. Um, but yeah, if you are a mom and you just need someone to talk to, feel free to DM me and um, just love having mm-hmm. those conversations and being there for, for you. It's wonderful. So. And I can speak to the fact that if you have any creative needs, if you are interested in podcasting, <laughs> uh, anything at all, Hi Hello Labs is amazing. You guys do a Thank great you. job. Thank, yeah. you so Thank you so much. Thank you for too. trusting us. I do want to take a moment and kind of speak to our listeners and say you, you've heard a lot of information today about, you know, special needs children and how it affects the family. And if there is a, a family within your community, somebody that you know, a friend, that you know their life has changed because there is a child that has been affected in this way, uh, don't isolate them. Don't ostracize them. Reach out to them. Continue on in that relationship and friendship as always and just continue to show them the love of Christ. Uh, and I will say this, as the church, we have to do better in this area. This is not something that is going away. This is not something that we can just sweep under the rug. But within our churches, we need to be inclusive. We need to be churches that are that welcome families with special needs children with open arms, including them in children's church activities, uh, training our volunteers, uh, having the resources available that are going to be helpful to these different families. So within the body of Christ, this is an area that we work on, but we need to continue to work on and do even better uh, day after day and year after year. So it's been a great time talking about this. And just be here and hearing a real family sharing the different things that they have walked through. So uh, to all of our listeners, if you have enjoyed this, uh, do us a favor, leave a review, leave a comment. Uh, if there's an episode that you have, you know, hey, let's talk about this topic. Uh, put that in a comment. We would love to be able to entertain that thought and possibly do an episode regarding whatever the, the topic might be. Uh, help us out to, to be able to move this podcast forward. Uh, This podcast is actually powered and it grows based off of your reviews, based off of you liking, subscribing, sharing this with your friends, your neighbors, different ones uh, within your social media uh, realm. So thank you for being a part of this podcast today. And as always, I'm Jay. And I'm Stacy. And this has been Love Like Crazy.